Here's how unverified information can change the landscape of a war and pave the way for horrific outcomes. You've likely seen the headlines about 40 babies being beheaded by Hamas fighters in the Kfar Aza village in southern Israel. It's hard to miss. It's everywhere. It's been carried by a number of reputable news outlets, repeated on live TV by powerful political figures, and featured on the front cover of British newspapers. The only problem is, there's so far no proof to the story. But it hasn't stopped a spiraling and dizzying loop of hysteria from dominating the news cycle over the last few days. So how did it spread? And what is it being used to justify? This story was first reported by the Israeli news outlet I-24 on Tuesday. During an on-the-ground report in the kibbutz of Kfar Aza, an Israeli reporter first mentions the incident. David, it's hard to even explain exactly just the mass casualties that happened right here. In fact, the Israeli military says they still don't have a clear number, but I'm talking to some of the soldiers and they say what they've witnessed as they've been walking through these different houses, these different communities, uh, babies, their heads cut off. That's what they said. Nicole Zedek later clarified that the claim came from one of the Israeli commanders she spoke to. Uh, we walk door after door. We kill a lot of the terrorists. We are stronger than them. They are aggressive. They are very bad. They cut head of children, cut head of women, but we are stronger than them. The claim was immediately picked up by other reporters. It was repeated on the front page of the Times newspaper by reporter Anshel Pfeffer featuring in the headline in quote marks. But in the story itself, there are no quotes that back up the story. Instead, Pfeiffer writes, some soldiers said there were up to 40 babies' corpses found, and that there were claims that some had their throats cut. But no one is named as having said the quote, and the reporter, despite being on the ground as bodies were being excavated, doesn't claim to have seen this himself. It's also repeated on the front pages of The Independent, Metro, The Telegraph, and The Sun. All of them cite Nicole Zedek's report but cannot verify it themselves. By Wednesday, questions around the accuracy of the story begin to surface, particularly after a report by Anadolu Agency cites the IDF saying they had not confirmed the allegations. A number of reporters who ran the story then begin to walk it back, saying they were simply repeating what they had heard from soldiers and from the I-24 story. By the evening, the story had changed again, with CNN announcing they had confirmed it with Israeli Prime Minister's office. We have some really uh, disturbing new information yeah. uh, out of Israel. The Israeli Prime Minister's spokesman just confirmed babies and toddlers were found with their heads decapitated. No, we had been hearing reports that this had happened, but now we are getting this confirmed directly from the Israeli Prime Minister's office. But that seemed to have been picked up from an interview between Tal Heinrich, a spokesperson from Benjamin Netanyahu, with LBC where she cites the same source as the initial story, soldiers on the ground. When you listed the unconscionable atrocities that took place in that kibbutz, you did say that babies had been decapitated. Can I take that as confirmation then? Because that currently is being reported as reported action. That has actually happened, as it? Tom? Toddlers, toddlers, babies, I can tell you that they, uh, some of them, yeah, heads were cut off. This, this is what we're hearing from, uh, I, I, from soldiers on the ground. And yes, they cut off heads. They cut off heads. Then on Wednesday evening, the U.S. president repeated the claim during a live broadcast, saying he had seen the pictures himself. I, I, I've been doing this a long time. I never really thought that I would see and have confirmed pictures of terrorists beheading children. I never thought I'd ever, anyway. That was picked up by almost every US media outlet who ran the story as having finally been confirmed. Then, the White House retracted the statement, telling media Biden and other US officials have not seen pictures or confirmed such reports independently. The US president's remarks were based on media reports and claims made by Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's spokesperson. An IDF spokesperson then tells Sky News Australia that the story has been verified and cites two sources who spoke to the media. I can tell you that it's been verified firsthand by a senior official in our coronary ser service. It's, and there's a person, a senior person who was identified on record, I think he was on CBS News, personally testified to the fact that he indeed saw uh, the heads of uh, severed uh, babies. Uh, and I know that the Israeli Prime Minister's Office has also corroborated the news. 
I, of course, haven't seen the atrocity myself, but I think those two sources enough. But when Sky News interviewed two IDF spokespeople on the ground at Kifar Aza, neither of them mentions the claims, despite speaking in detail about the civilian deaths in the village. When Business Insider tried to press the IDF for proof, spokesperson Major Nir Dinar responded, saying the IDF would not investigate the condition of the bodies. Quote, the war crimes that Hamas committed are obvious to the world and are seen in the world. And I don't need to provide any proof of that, and I'm not going to, Dinar said. It's disrespectful for the dead. When pressed further, he said the IDF were relying on testimonies from soldiers pointing to the same video originally aired by I-24. Back to square one. Until today, no conclusive official statement has been released by Netanyahu's office, the IDF, or the coroner's office, shutting down the skepticism around the reports once and for all. It is a horrific circular debate unlikely to be resolved soon. But the conduct of the media must be scrutinized because there are real consequences. To be clear, all the reporting from the ground in places like Kafar Aza indicates hundreds of civilians were killed, and the details are gruesome and hard to comprehend. However, there is always a need for accuracy, specifically in times of war. What Hamas is accused of could potentially amount to war crimes, which means there is a procedure in place for collecting evidence, documenting eyewitness testimony, and verifying each and every claim. When this isn't done, it feeds into a cycle of violent escalation, and in the worst times, justifies the horrific collective punishment of civilians we are now witnessing in Gaza by Israel's army. A siege is appropriate, cutting off power, cutting off water, secure. Well, I think that Israel does have that right. It is an ongoing situation. Do you think um, cutting off food, water and electricity is within international law? I think that Israel has an absolute right to defend itself That's against not terrorism. That's the question I asked. It is an answer to the question that, that you've asked and I think it's an appropriate one at this time. Hamas is a bunch of animals uh, who deserve to be treated like animals. Which they know is going to result in a massive reprisal, in a right justified, completely supported by the West reprisal. And we are unequivocally in support of the State of Israel um, as they deal with that threat, uh, and they have the absolute right to defend themselves. It isn't about semantics, the minute details of what did or didn't happen. It's about how stories like this one are being used to silence the criticism of Israel's response in Gaza. The cutting off of water, electricity and food to more than 2 million people, the relentless and indiscriminate shelling of entire neighborhoods, infrastructure, border crossings, shelters, school. At least 20 families have been extinguished. Thousands more are farewelling each other and preparing to die, knowing there is no way out. This is what is happening right now. Whenever these realities are put to officials, they rebut them by citing the news reports, the ones that haven't been properly verified, but whose impacts have already dominated this war. Hundreds of children have died, there's a blockade on we, fuel. We actually lost 1,200 people that murdered. We are living close to monsters, to inhuman people. And we are fighting for our home, and we will win. Are you seriously keep on asking me about Palestinian civilians? What's, what's wrong with you? Have you not seen what happened? We're fighting Nazis. Israel's army has a history of strategic use of unconfirmed reports. In 2021, during the 10-day bombing raid of Gaza, a number of news organizations, including the New York Times, published a report of a ground invasion of Gaza by Israel, citing an IDF tweet. But that wasn't true. A few hours later, the IDF clarified it had been a miscommunication but it wasn't. Israeli news reports later described it as a ruse by the IDF to trick Hamas into giving up their positions, and they knew that international media would amplify the statement. Last year, when veteran Palestinian reporter Shadi Nabahakla was killed while covering an Israeli raid on the city of Jenin, IDF accounts published videos of Palestinian militants claiming that they had likely killed her. That report was picked up by international media, It was false. We investigated the incident and concluded, along with other media outlets, that Israeli snipers had killed her, something the IDF later conceded. In Bob Woodward's book, Rage, the American journalist describes an incident from 2017 
where Benjamin Netanyahu allegedly shows Donald Trump a video of the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas ordering the killing of children. However, after the meeting, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson tells Trump he believes the video was doctored. Just this week, another instance of unverified footage being released and shared by government sources. The video claims to show a police interrogation of a Hamas militant admitting to the rape of women and children. On Wednesday, it was published and shared by multiple Israeli government accounts, including by a foreign ministry spokesperson. <laughs> Then, it was deleted, but not before it had spread like wildfire across social media. Despite this repeating pattern, many journalists continue to take information fed by Israeli soldiers as fact. And when these misleading reports become headlines, it allows Israeli officials to shut down public debate about its military protocols, especially those in clear breach of international law. This is how misinformation spreads in times of war. It is how armies and governments can seek to manipulate media to alter public perception. And when journalists don't fulfill their obligations to rigorously fact-check claims before they publish them, it leads to disastrous consequences. Here's an example. In October 1990, a Kuwaiti teenager spoke before US Congress, revealing a horrifying testimony that during Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, she had personally witnessed Iraqi soldiers taking babies out of incubators at hospitals and leaving them to die. The story became headline news. It was corroborated by Amnesty International. It was cited publicly by US President George H.W. Bush and used to rally Congress to support a military intervention against Iraq. The thing is, the story wasn't true. The teenager who spoke in Congress was later identified as Naira al-Sabah the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador, and that her story was written by a public relations campaign lobbying for military intervention. When the Gulf War did begin, the crippling sanctions imposed on Iraq and the military tactics of US and allied forces were defended by citing these and other reports that highlighted the barbarity of Iraqi soldiers. In February 1991, coalition forces bombed an Iraqi convoy that was retreating from Kuwait near the city of Al Jahra. Hundreds of vehicles were destroyed, with almost all of the occupants inside killed. For years, this strip of road was known as the Highway of Death. In the lead up to the Second Gulf War, journalists repeated the same mistake, taking the US government's claims of weapons of mass destruction held in Iraq at face value, allowing them to be used as justification for the invasion and occupation of Iraq. Again, as we now know, there was never any evidence. But by the time the truth came to light, more than a million Iraqis were dead, more than five million children orphaned, and an entire region permanently destabilized. Headlines matter. And in war, the battle over headlines is a fight to control the narrative. Journalists must always hold their head above the fray. It is our job to distinguish fact from fiction, because the words we publish matter, and their impacts cannot simply be retracted. This week is a perfect example of what happens when journalism fails. And as this war drags on, we must hold ourselves to a much higher standard.